Well, good morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word this morning about why we worship. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do me a favor? Reach out to your friends, family members, everyone you know. Let's get as many people as possible on a weekly basis watching our online service. All right, I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. Good morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could be with us for this week's online service. I encourage you to turn to your Bibles to Romans, the eighth chapter, uh, verse 31, uh, Romans, the first chapter, verse 18, and then Psalm 100. All right, we're going to look at three separate scriptures today that I think will be very um, helpful for framing. Um, the question that I'm going to develop uh, this morning, and that is this, simply, why do we worship? Okay, why do we worship? Well, we talked about this scripture last week, but I think it's very fitting uh, to set the stage about uh, why we worship to reread Romans 8, 31 to 39, because it is an expression of, of, of the blessings of God. It's an expression of God's goodness to his people. It's an expression of all of the love that God has lavished upon us in Christ and through Christ and through Christ's ministry. And to me, when you finish reading this section of scripture, you cannot help but praise God. It's so powerful. So let's read it. What shall we then say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge to those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What what a powerful section of scripture. To me, if you cannot read this without getting ready to shout and say, praise God, I thank you so much for your goodness to us through Christ. I don't know what does and what would fire us up to do it. But can we pray as we begin this message this morning? Father, I thank you so much for what your word tells us in Romans 8 and how through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the ministry of Christ and through his redemption, through the justification we have in Christ, we are sanctified, we are justified, we are glorified, Lord. And and this section of scripture is so powerful. And Lord God, it makes me wanna erupt in praise and thanksgiving to you. So God, I pray this morning as we talk about why do we praise, God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, God. And and God, my, my, my ultimate, request this morning is that as a result of of hearing this message god you would prompt every single one of us god to be a people of praise and all we are and all we do and father i thank you for this in jesus name amen so let's talk about it this morning why do we praise Again, if reading Romans 8, 31 to 39 doesn't do it for you, well then, hey, let's get into it a little more deeply, okay? And and first of all, we need to realize that that praise and, and the worship of the living God is the most reasonable thing that we could ever do. And see, this is how Paul begins his uh, development of the power of the gospel in the book of Romans. Because if you remember, we've talked about this before, Paul is making a sustained argument as to the blessings of the gospel all throughout the, 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 his letter to the Romans. So from Romans 1.18 to Romans 8.39, it's an extended argument. And if you remember, the beginning of this argument uh, is all about worship. And what Paul essentially says is the unbelieving, the Gentile, pagan world, they go astray. 
because they're all worshipers and they are very good worshipers. The problem is the object of their worship is not the living God, it's an idol. And because of that, they get off track. So let's read this. It says this, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 1, 21. Let's do that, Romans 1, 21 to 23, okay? For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but in their thinking they became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. So in Romans 1.18, Paul says, listen, the wrath of God is being poured out upon the ungodly Gentile pagan world because of their, well, their lack of worship for the living God. And, and the scripture says in Romans 1 21, they knew God. In other words, every person in this world uh, if that doesn't know Jesus, the Bible says clearly they knew God. At one time, they had a sense of reverence or at least a knowledge of God but they rejected that, they suppressed that truth and unrighteousness, and they began to worship uh, idols. And, and if you follow the logic, again, I don't have time to develop all this, but if you read the rest of Romans chapter one, it says that basically they, they rejected the living God, and they began to basically exchange that glory for, um, for images, uh, for created things. And, and they began to worship beasts and then if you follow what happens at the back end of the chapter, they become beasts themselves, right? They, they, they embrace all kinds of sexual immorality. They embrace all kinds of sexual perversions, wickedness, homosexuality, lesbianism. And then God finally says in, in Romans 1 28, God finally says, fine, you want that? You wanna reject me? Then I'll give you more of what you've asked for. And they actually are given a depraved mind. It is not a pretty picture. And see, what, what Paul is trying to develop here in, in the book of Romans is we're all gonna worship. We all worship. But, but the problem is uh, we, we don't worship the living God. We go after lesser gods, lesser absolutes than the living God. And so the most reasonable thing that we can do in light of what God has done for us is to worship him. But many people are not that reasonable, which leads us to the second point we're talking about. And that's this, is that we were made to worship. It doesn't matter if you're not a Christian. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist. It doesn't matter if you're a progressive fundamentalist. You were made to worship. In fact, the Bible's really clear. If you go back to Exodus chapter 20 and, and, and the Ten Commandments, and, and the very first one, you shall have no other gods except me. And the second commandment is don't make any graven images. And so it implies at least two things. Number one, we were all made to worship. We will worship because that's how we're made. We cannot not worship because that's how we're made. However, <laughs> we have a choice. We can worship the living God or we can choose to, live, to worship lesser gods. We can worship idols, God surrogates, right? Something in place of God. And that begins to affect us and affect our lives. And so we see this fundamentally going way back prior to Exodus to the book of Genesis, the first chapter. And it says this in Genesis chapter one, verse 27. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And so God created human beings to be imaging beings that reflect his glory. And so at the core of this, this idea is that we were made to image God. We were made to reflect God, <clears throat> to reflect his glory. But if we don't reflect God and we don't reflect his glory, we will begin to reflect something that is far less th than God. <laughs> and, and the problem is it leads to ruin. It leads to destruction. Uh, Hosea, the eighth chapter, verse four says this, God gave them idols to their own destruction. And so, so there's this idea of God giving us what we desire. If we desire the living God, we begin to image God. We begin to reflect God. We begin to reflect his glory and his goodness. If we choose to reject God, God will give us over to the idolatrous worship that we're pursuing, but it'll lead to some form of destruction. Well, what are you talking about, Pastor Eric? Well, I think we, we can look no further than the idea of abortion, right? We've been sacrificing in America since 1973 in Roe versus Wade, the legal the nationalization 
of abortion throughout the country. We, we have literally been sacrificing baby human beings, baby image bearers on the altar of sexual pleasure, on the altar of, hey, I have, I have the right to choose for myself whether or not I'm gonna have an abortion. And in the process, we've emphasized women's rights to the exclusion of these little babies. Do they matter? Do they count? In fact, the Bible is very clear in the Old Testament, standing up for the innocent, standing up for those that don't have a voice. I think babies in a mother's womb definitely count for that. So if we choose to not image God, we're gonna image something else. We're gonna image sex. We're gonna image pleasure. We're gonna image material stuff. We're gonna image uh, fame. We're gonna image fortune. We're gonna reflect something other than God and it leads to a twisting and a distortion of what it means to be human. And so it's a powerful thing. And so, so we're made to worship. We cannot not worship. And so how do you know where and what you worship? And it's real, real simple. I like how Louis Giglio phrases this in his book, um, uh, the, the air we breathe. He simply says this, listen, you want to know what you worship? Um, you simply follow the trail of your time, your affections, your energy, your money, your loyalty. And at the end of that trail, you will find a throne. And whatever is on that throne is what you worship. And again, there's a lot of people that claim to worship God. They claim to serve the living God, but they give lip service to God, but they're far more interested in their kids' sports or they're far more interested in climbing the corporate ladder, or they're far more interested in, again, pick your interest, pick your addiction, okay? And again, I've said this many, many times, America is called the land of the free, but it's also the home of a thousand addictions. In other words, if, you're, if you worship the living God and you put him ultimate, you're not gonna be beholden to and beset by all kinds of addictions that mess up people's lives, okay? So, so we're worshipers, right? It's reasonable to worship God. And God has given us a protocol to worship him. And again, the, one of the best examples of this is in Psalm 100 verse four, which simply says this, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And this is a great scripture that gives us the foundations for why we worship God in song in worship services. A lot of people will ask me, hey, why do you spend the first 35, 45 minutes of your worship service singing songs of praise to God? Why do you do that? Why do you get past that and get to the good stuff, the preaching of the word? Well, listen, worship is <laughs> an end in itself. Worship is how God created us. And so we learn to worship the living God within a corporate worship gathering, and that is formational. That is discipleship. In other words, we're gonna be pressed to worship all kinds of other things during the course of the week. And so we need to learn to put God first. We need to learn to prioritize God. That's why we have a Sabbath. That's why we set aside a day to gather together as a church body and worship together. Because guess what? If we don't do that, we will put something else in its place. And so worship gathering as the local church on a Sunday morning, honoring God on the Sabbath as a family, presenting yourselves before the Lord within a local church fellowship, it's formative, it's discipleship. It is a liturgy, if you will, that shapes us and forms us and orients our lives around the living God and worshiping God in song and worshiping God as a gathered community of believers is very biblical. And in fact, God calls us to do that as we approach him. Think of it. If we were going to approach the president of the United States or the president of any other country in the world, you don't just kind of run up and go, hey, bro, what's up, dude? What's happening, man? You want to do lunch? You don't do that. There's a way you talk to them. There's a way you greet them. There's a way you, if you will, revere and honor them and honor the particular office uh, 
that they hold. Well, if that's true within, um, again, within political circles throughout the world, how much more so to approach the king of the universe? And that's exactly what Psalm 100 verse 4 talks about. It talks about the protocol for approaching the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so it gives us four really important words that we need to remember. It talks about enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter that entry point of coming before the Lord. It's the idea of thanksgiving. It's, it's the Hebrew word tada, which means praise given at a cost. So praise, worship costs something. Again, okay? it carries with it the idea we see in Leviticus, the seventh chapter and verse 12. It talks about fellowship offerings, offerings that you present to the Lord. Well, how do you present an offering to the Lord? Well, it cost the worshiper something. It says this in Leviticus 7 verse 12, if he offers it as an expression of thankfulness, then along with his thank offering, he is to offer cakes of bread made without yeast, mixed with oil, wafers made without yeast and spread with oil, and cakes of fine flour well kneaded and mixed with oil. And so again, it's this idea of verbally giving God praise, give verbally giving God thanks. But as you do, you're bringing something, you're bringing, well, food, if you will, that you prepared to give the Lord. It actually costs you something. So one of the things we understand about worship before the Lord praising God is simply it's a cost. And, and, and this idea is captured for the New Testament in Hebrews 13, verse 15, which says this, through Jesus, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that confess his name. And so again, it carries with it the idea of a cost. Well, what's the cost? Well, there's times where you and I don't feel like worshiping. You and I had just a terrible week or a terrible weekend or you got stuff going on in your life or you're distracted or, or you didn't even want to get up and go to church. And so it's, it's less costly to stay home and worship with Reverend Sheets and Pastor Pillow than presenting yourself and your family before the Lord in corporate gathering. That's a cost, right? So, so what we learn about this is that to, to worship God, it costs you something. In other words, if we truly value the Lord, we're gonna press through all of the obstacles. We're gonna press through the, the, the challenges to our soul when perhaps we don't want to worship or we don't want to lift up our hands or we don't want to sing in worship to the Lord and we don't want to bow in reverence before him because we're concerned about, oh my goodness, what will other people think, right? It might cost you, it, you know, it might cost you your pride. You might have to swallow your pride. Worship costs you something. That's the idea we see here. But it says, enter his gates with praise that is costly. In other words, it's valuable. What you esteem too lightly, right? What, what, what you um, esteem too lightly, you will not value. You will not value that, that worship of the living God. So it means that. So tada means praise that is costly. It also means thanksgiving in songs of worship. So that's why we sing. That's why we sing songs at the beginning of a worship service, because that's how divine protocol entering his presence, okay? And second of all, it says this in Psalm 100, verse four, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, but enter his courts with praise. That, that word praise is the Hebrew word tehillah, which basically means singing publicly to God, or it means, for lack of a better term, a sing-along, all right? This, this idea of, of people singing together the praises of God. There's something powerful that happens in corporate worship where God's people sing together in song. And we see the same New Testament parallel in Ephesians, the fifth chapter and verses 19 to 20. What does it say? It says, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. So again, this idea of enter his courts with praise, with, with collective singing with God's people. It brings about a unity. It brings about a corporate anointing, the presence of God more powerful with a gathered church than a scattered church. There's something about a gathered church gathered together in worship that brings about the, pre the corporate presence of the Holy Spirit. It's an incredible dynamic.
But then it goes on to say, it says, give thanks to him, right? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his course with praise. Give thanks to him. To him, so that word "give thanks" is the is the Hebrew word "yada," which means to revere or to worship with extended hands. Again, it, it, it speaks of surrender. It speaks of reverence. It speaks of reaching out to God with our physical attributes, our hands, our arms, our bodies, reaching out to God. That's why we raise our hands in a time of worship. It's a it's a it's a reverential posture. It's a posture of surrender. It's a posture of presenting our members to God as instruments of righteousness, as Romans 6 even talks about, okay? So, so it's powerful. Again, the New Testament equivalent would be in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. Now, it was common for the Jews to lift their hands in prayer. And so prayer and worship were intermingled reverential concepts. So it was not unusual for Jews to lift their hands in worship, to lift their hands in prayer. And so, so the Apostle Paul says, listen, I want you to, to lift your hands when you pray, but also by, by, by implication, lifting up your hands in worship without anger, without disputing. In other words, making sure there's no issue be, with you uh, and another believer to make sure that you have clean hands and a clean heart before the Lord. Okay, so a giving of thanks to the Lord to revere and worship Him with extended hands. And then finally, it says, uh, after you've entered his gates with thanksgiving, you've entered his courts with praise, you've given thanks to him, and it says, and praise his name. That's the Hebrew word barak, which means to kneel or to bless God as an act of adoration. So we're seeing our bodies are used to worship God. It talks about presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice to the Lord in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It talks about when Jesus says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all their mind, and all thy strength. Kneeling, raising our hands, getting our bodies involved in worship. In other words, it's not kind of this, hey, I'll just wait and see how things go. And if I feel like getting into it, I will. If I don't feel like I want to get into it, I won't. But hey, I'm just going to be passive. All of this speaks of active engagement with God in worship and in song, singing with our voices, singing with other brothers and sisters, raising our hands, kneeling, engaged together with the living God. And again, we see the New Testament parallel to this in Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15, where it says, Paul says, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole body in heaven and on earth derives its name. Paul has been talking about the greatness of God and the goodness of God in this section of scripture. And as a result of that, his, his, his reasonable response is, I just, gotta, I just gotta bow in my knees before God and just exalt him because God is good and God is faithful. So we see this idea of worship is something that is, is, is um, what's, what's the best way I can say it? It, it is a dynamic that God has um, prepared for his people to approach him and to come in his presence. We already know we're made to worship. We image God. That's the way we're made. If we don't image God, we'll image something lesser than God. We'll image an idol and we'll become just like that idol, worthless ourselves. And so we worship the living God. We honor him. We adore him. We lift him up because it's reasonable to do. We're made to worship. And oh, by the way, God has given us a heavenly protocol to approach him. And so all of this is important. And maybe some of you that have heard, are listening today, you're like, gosh, I know that. I've known that decades ago. Well, my question to you is, are you doing it? Every single Sunday, are you raising your hands? Are you lifting them before the Lord? Are you kneeling before the Lord? Are you singing before the Lord? Are you doing it privately and publicly? Is it a part of your life? Is there evidence in your life that you have a revelation of praise and worship and that you are somebody that is an active worshiper of the living God? Well, maybe you're watching this and going, hey, 
this helps me. I actually finally understand why we do what we do on Sunday morning. This is why we stand. This is why we raise our hands. This is why we sing. This is why we kneel. And again, my challenge to you is embrace this. Begin to worship God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength because there's a protocol to approach the Lord and it's in worship and it's in praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your hearts. Enter his courts with praise, right? And it talks about this and it's so powerful. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So my prayer for all of you is that we would all become better worshipers of God. We will worship something. We will worship someone. The issue is not whether or not we're worshipers. The issue is this. Some of us have really bad gods and we need to turn to the living God and worship him. But it, with the same zeal and passion that some people throw into an alcohol bottle or into a drug fix or into some other high in their life. We're meant to give all we are to the living God and worship him. And I'm telling you, as someone who has made praise and worship part and parcel of his life in the, for over the last 32 years, I'm telling you, it changes everything. It changes everything. It'll dramatically change your life because it talks about in God's presence is fullness of joy. In his presence is, is power, in his presence is refreshing, in his presence is healing, and my prayer is that every single one of us will move from more of a passive stance of worship toward a more active sta stance of engaging in worship like Psalm 100 verse four says. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for what your word says about worship and about praise. And God, as Romans 8, 31 to 39 talks about, God, if God is for us, who can be against us? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ, through Christ Jesus, God. So God, that should, that should propel us toward worship, that should propel us toward praise, that should prompt us, Father, to lift up the living God and exalt him with all we have and all we are. So God, my prayer is that God, everyone here that is listening, God, would get a revelation of praise and worship. And God would move from a passive stance in worship, but God, to an active stance of actively engaging the Lord, lifting up our hands, kneeling before him, singing with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and sensing the presence of the Lord where there's fullness of joy. God, I pray this over your people now, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Church, I hope this was an encouragement to you. I encourage you, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. All right, I'll see you next week. Take care.